A cylinder small enough to hide in your palm, light enough to forget you're holding it. Inside, nothing looks remarkable, just sheets of metal and powder rolled like a scroll. Yet it runs our cameras, our cars, our satellites. It keeps planes in the air, conversations alive, and the glow in the screens we stare into each night. We rarely think about it, yet it waits quietly in our pockets, on our desks, in the walls of our homes. A small vessel of stored lightning, born from decades of trial and risk. It changed the world and almost didn't happen. The humble core of modern power. Crack one open and you'll see nothing that looks like the future. Two thin foils, one dark, one pale, coated in powders and separated by a film so fragile you could tear it with your fingers. Rolled together, they make what engineers call the jelly roll, packed inside a steel shell and sealed from the world. At just 45 grams, it feels insubstantial. Yet it carries enough stored energy to light a room, drive a motor, or beam a signal across an ocean. In the early 1980s, most rechargeable batteries could barely manage 40 to 60 watt hours per kilogram. That meant a heavy block of cells to power a camera for minutes or a phone for half an hour. Portable electronics were limited by the weight of their lifeblood. Engineers everywhere were chasing the same dream. More energy in less space. A battery that could unlock new machines, new habits, new freedoms. What they didn't know was that the chemistry to make it possible had already been discovered quietly in the lab of a British chemist working for an oil giant. Oil crisis and an unlikely beginning. The story began in the shadow of an oil shock. In 1973, war in the Middle East sent fuel prices soaring, and Americans lined up for hours at gas stations that often ran dry before the sun set. The world's largest oil company, Exxon, faced a future it had never imagined. One where oil might not be enough. In a quiet corner of its New Jersey research lab, a young British chemist named Stanley Whittingham was experimenting with materials that could store and release energy. His attention fell on titanium disulfide, a layered crystal that could host lithium ions between its sheets, like books slipping onto a shelf. Lithium itself was a strange silvery metal, light, eager to give up its lone outer electron and capable of producing the highest voltage of any known metal. Paired together, these two materials hinted at something remarkable. A rechargeable battery far lighter and more powerful than anything else on the market. Exxon saw an answer to its fears. Whittingham was told to drop everything else. In his words, he could work on anything as long as it did not involve petroleum. Breaking the Voltage Barrier For decades, batteries had been trapped under an invisible ceiling. Using water-based electrolytes meant you could never push much past 1.23 volts before the water itself broke down, splitting into hydrogen and oxygen. That limited how much energy each cell could deliver. Whittingham's insight was to replace the water with an organic solvent carrying a lithium salt. It was volatile, unstable, and dangerous, but it could withstand higher voltages. With titanium disulfide as the cathode, pure lithium metal as the anode, and this new electrolyte between them, he reached 2.4 volts per cell, almost double the old limit. It was a quiet revolution in chemistry, a leap in energy density no one had thought possible. But pure lithium had a flaw. During repeated charging, it grew needle-like structures called dendrites. These could pierce the separator, short-circuit the cell, and trigger fires. At Exxon's lab, emergency calls to the fire department became routine. Still, the promise was undeniable. In 1976, Whittingham published his design. For a moment, 
it seemed the future of energy had arrived until oil prices fell and the urgency to change simply evaporated. Good enough sleep. Across the Atlantic, in a lab at Oxford University, physicist John B. Goodenough read Whittingham's paper and saw possibilities where others saw limits. Titanium disulfide, he realized, was holding the voltage back. What if the cathode were made from a compound even hungrier for electrons? He turned to lithium cobalt oxide, a material that, on paper, could deliver 4 volts per cell, nearly doubling Whittingham's result. There was another advantage. Lithium cobalt oxide already contained lithium within its crystal lattice. That meant the battery could start without dangerous lithium metal on the anode side at all. In theory, you could build it in a discharged state, then move the lithium into the anode during the first charge. Goodenough's tests confirmed it. Higher voltage, more energy, greater safety potential. But when he tried to interest companies, no one bit. Oxford refused to fund the patent. A government lab agreed, but only if he signed away his rights. The invention was filed in 1981 and left on a shelf. The second revolution in lithium batteries, like the first, stalled in silence, waiting for someone else to see its value. Yoshino's missing piece. In Japan, chemist Akira Yoshino was chasing the same problem from another angle, how to make a safer anode. Without metallic lithium, the danger of dendrites and fires could disappear. His first experiments used polyacetylene, a conductive plastic that could host lithium ions. It worked, but barely. The material was too light, unable to store enough energy for a practical cell. Then, while cleaning his desk at the end of 1982, Yoshino stumbled across Goodenough's paper on lithium cobalt oxide. Here was the missing source of lithium his design needed. He built a prototype pairing Goodenough's cathode with his lithium-free anode. It worked safely and reliably. Still, he needed a better anode material. The answer came from his own company, Vapor-Grown Carbon Fiber. Strong, conductive, and able to reversibly store lithium ions without breaking down, it transformed the cell's performance. When tested, it didn't explode under impact, even when fully charged. Yoshino knew then, this was the blueprint for a new generation of rechargeable batteries. But to bring it to the world, he would need a partner with the skill and courage to mass produce it. Sony's moment. That partner arrived in 1987, when Asahi Chemicals Isao Kuribayashi carried Yoshino's prototype materials in three unmarked jars to a small U.S. company called Battery Engineering. Working quietly in a converted garage, they assembled cylindrical cells without knowing they were building the first pre-production lithium-ion batteries. Kuribayashi returned to Japan with 200 working cells. Still, Asahi hesitated. They were not a battery manufacturer. Determined, he rolled one of the prototypes across a conference table at Sony. The engineers there immediately saw the potential. Sony refined the design, replacing Yoshino's carbon fiber with graphite, which could intercalate lithium ions even more efficiently. In 1991, they released the first commercial lithium ion battery in the Sony Handycam. It was compact, rechargeable, and free from unstable lithium metal. The name lithium ion became their marketing point, and soon a selling feature for laptops, mobile phones, and portable CD players. Competitors raced to catch up, and within a few years, the chemistry had spread everywhere. What began as an obscure lab project was now an invisible thread running through daily life, and it was only getting smaller, cheaper, and more powerful. The invisible shield. Even Sony's engineers didn't expect one quiet miracle inside their new battery. During the very first charge, something strange happened at the graphite anode. Lithium ions reacted with the electrolyte, forming a thin, complex layer of compounds. This layer, the solid electrolyte interface, 
or SEI, was not part of the design, but it saved the cell. The SEI sealed the anode surface from further reaction while still letting lithium ions pass through. Without it, the anode and electrolyte would keep reacting until the battery destroyed itself. With it, the chemistry stabilized, and the cell could be recharged hundreds, even thousands of times. That stability, combined with falling production costs, triggered a revolution. From 1991 to the early 2000s, the price of lithium-ion cells dropped sharply as energy density climbed. Devices that had once been tethered to walls by power cords became truly portable. The same chemistry that ran a camcorder could now power a laptop for hours and eventually an electric car for hundreds of miles. The lithium-ion battery had crossed the threshold from invention to infrastructure, an unseen foundation of modern life. Fire in the wires. For all its reliability, lithium-ion carries a quiet danger. Inside each cell lies the complete recipe for fire, fuel in the electrolyte, oxygen in the cathode, and heat from its reactions. If the separator is damaged, or if heat builds faster than it can escape, the balance breaks. Around 80 degrees Celsius, the protective SEI layer begins to fail. At roughly 130 degrees Celsius, the separator melts, letting the anode and cathode touch, triggering a violent short. The cathode releases oxygen, feeding the flames from within. Such failures are rare, perhaps one in a million. But billions of cells mean they will happen. Airlines carry fireproof containment bags. Electric vehicle fires can take hours and thousands of liters of water to cool. Engineers have made them safer. But the truth remains. Lithium ion is stored in lightning, wrapped in metal. Powerful, portable, indispensable, and never entirely without risk. Lithium ion is a triumph, but it is not the end. In labs around the world, scientists are chasing chemistries that charge faster, last longer, and use materials more abundant than lithium or cobalt. Solid state cells, sodium ion, metal air, each holds promise, each faces its obstacles. The future of energy storage will not be built on one element, but on many, woven together into systems we have yet to imagine. For now, the lithium-ion battery remains our quiet companion, a scroll of metal and powder holding a storm inside, a storm that powers the world until something greater takes its place.